All right, today we're gonna to be looking at the Ming and Xing dynasty of China uh, and looking at kind of uh, uh, not only how they came about, some of their culture and, and then uh, especially collapse with the Ming dynasty and transition to the Xing dynasty. So the first one we're going to be looking at is the Ming dynasty. Move this. Okay. Um, the Ming dynasty came about uh, with the overthrow of the Mongols uh, and uh, reestablishing uh, uh, Chinese control of China. Because of this, there was a, a strong desire to reestablish um, control of, of Chinese traditions. And not just uh, uh, control, but um, put back into place practices, belief systems, structure that had not been present during the Mongol rule. Uh, and, and that traced back to, to really the beginning of Chinese society. One of those that took place was filial piety. Now, filial piety, uh, in, in its essence, is, is extreme devotion. This uh, was something that was established at the very beginning of Chinese society uh, and, and structured all aspects of, of family life, of political life, uh, of Chinese society as a whole. The idea being that within this uh, extreme devotion for family, you have uh, respect for your elders and that there's a clear hierarchy with uh, the oldest family member at the top. Uh, and then from there, it would be any male, older relative, such as, right, that could be a father. And then mother would be next. And then if you had a son and then a daughter. Right. And if there was a grandparent, they would be above and so on. And, and then how this got structured into the political sphere is that uh, it was the idea that the king was the uh, highest of the uh, ranking family members. So they, they put it into the family, but then it was also part of the political realm. But the, the extreme devotion with this was, of course, then uh, initially how it started was that you uh, did whatever possible and needed uh, for uh, family, specifically uh, that the older uh, family members were above lower family members and you showed respect and deference to those older family members and that was extremely important uh, within the system and structure of society to give you an example of this i want to show you a couple of stories of filial piety and, and now these are like kind of proverbs or tales um, some are, are more realistic than others. There's some that go to the extreme that obviously they're not expecting that that actually happens, but it's meant to make a point about, uh, how this, how far extreme devotion is supposed to go. So if we look at, um, uh, uh, some of these stories, here's one, right? Um, when this, uh, uh, Lala was 70, his parents were still alive. He wants to give them cheer and make them laugh daily. Sometimes he, uh, sometimes he holds some water, passes before his parents, purposely falls down. Sometimes he wears the clothes of a clown and makes fun in front of his parents. While other times he assumes the form of a child and plays beneath his parents' knees. It is only the sage with filial piety who never loses the innocence of a pure child. So the idea is, and here's the, the picture of it, that the, he's willing to go to extremes to make his parents happy. That's filial piety. Another uh, example of one, um, 
is uh, right here. His father dies and he has no money to bury his father. Therefore, he sells himself as a slave to a rich man. While on the way to the rich man to work, he meets a kind girl who begs to be his wife and wants to work as a weaver at the rich man's house in his place. After she repays his debt, she then says goodbye to her husband and flies up to heaven. He then begins to know that she is no common vulgar girl. Uh, the, so this one, this one also was a very common uh, uh, one. So the first one is just this idea of the willingness of a, a son to act the fool, uh, to make his older parents laugh, even willing to play and act like a kid, even though he's 70 years old. This one goes a little bit further. And, and these were common stories too, where, uh, one, because of filial piety, proper ancestor worship and respect of, of the dead required, you know, proper burial. And since he didn't have money to, to bury his father properly, he sold himself into slavery. And that's the filial piety part, right? The willingness to sell yourself into slavery in order to fulfill filial piety. Now, again, the, the expectation that people were actually selling themselves into slavery for filial piety is, is not uh, the same as the story of trying to show these extreme, extreme versions of filial piety in these stories and tales to showcase that, that sense of it. Um, so there is a, a, a disconnect between the, these parables and the reality of what happened with it, but, but it gives you the idea of, of how important and how, um, serious they took filial piety. Now, this is this, the part that's different within this story, right? Is that then he, on his way to be a slave for this man, um, he meets this girl who says she's going to work as a weaver and help repay his debt. Uh, instead of him. And then when she does, she disappears into heaven. They call her what a fairy girl or, or something from heaven. So this is, this is often a part of it is showing that if you are willing to go to the extreme for filial piety and, and sell yourself into slavery, then you will be rewarded, right? So that he ended up not having to be into slavery. Instead, this, this girl that pretended to be his wife, that was really from heaven, ends up repaying his debt because of his uh, observance of filial piety. Um, th this goes into, there's other stories. So there's another one where um, a, a man, um, he's out in the fields and he, he feels a, a pain in his arm and he rushes back to find that his mother has hurt his arm. So one, he's so in tune with his parents with filial piety that when they feel pain, he feels pain. But then the second part is that then he like cuts off his arm and gives it to her um, so that she is not without an arm because her injury was so bad. Another story was that um, a family, a husband, a wife, and their infant son live with their mother and they're really poor and they realize that they can't afford to feed their mother properly um, and she's always giving her food to the, her, their infant son, distraught at feeling as if they had failed in filial piety for taking care, uh, properly of his mother, him and his wife talk and decide that they, the only thing that they can do is kill their infant son, um, and so that they can properly provide for the mother. As they're digging a grave, they haven't killed the son yet, but they're digging a grave in preparation. He hits a box, he digs it out, and his name's engraved on top. And when he opens it, it's full of, of gold coins. Again, that's the reward component, right? So you have the other ones where there's no reward, and it's just that they're doing something proper and extreme. Another one, and then you have the other ones where you are doing something that's significantly more serious, I suppose, and then you, but they are stopped and given a reward instead for being so proper with filial piety. You, you see another one, one last one with that was that a man, um, his, he, uh, they were poor and they only had one mosquito net and his, uh, there were lots of mosquitoes in the area. And so wanting to protect his parents from, uh, getting bit, even because the mosquito net had holes in it, it wasn't perfect. Uh, after they went to bed, he snuck in and laid down on the floor, on their floor, and didn't move, allowing all the mosquitoes to bite him rather than to molest his parents. So th that's the idea of filial piety. And it, and it was something that was established at the beginning of, of, of Chinese society and was uh, significant. And so this was something that they looked to reestablish um, with uh, the overthrow of the Mongols. One of the benefits of filial piety when it comes to political 
uh, aspects of it is that it makes it harder to um, question the king or challenge his authority. So while, of course, you have it within just the family structure, uh, by reestablishing filial piety, it, it was it was it was to harken back to uh, ancient Chinese traditions, but it also reestablished control. Right, this allows for control and authority, and in that way, it secures uh, some structure. And we'll see that this actually becomes problematic because the king, the various emperors during the Ming Dynasty, eventually become extremely ineffective. Now, the Ming Dynasty lasts for several hundred years, so. Uh, you have some emperors that are just fine, uh, kings and emperors that are just fine, and others, though, as uh, it, it comes to the end of the Ming Dynasty, that ultimately are not very good. And uh, this is allowed to continue because the reality is, is that the administration and people around emperor uh, were hesitant to intercede and uh, chastise or, or tell the king that maybe he should change what he's doing because filial piety put a lot of restrictions on that um, in a variety of ways. So that was one of the first things that happened. The next thing that they did is that they rebuilt um, uh, the, the China's Great Wall, the Great Wall of China. Um, the original Great Wall of China um, was actually built uh, during the Xin Dynasty, which was uh, uh, several dynasties before them. And it was uh, the original wall uh, was significantly smaller than what the wall is today. And the wall was to keep invaders out, including the Mongols, that eventually it failed in, in that respect. Um, but the, this was an attempt to reestablish uh, control and uh, security, right? They wanted to re-secure their borders, uh, make sure that they didn't have a resurgence of, of people. And this uh, uh, policy certainly is going to reflect some of the uh, anti-world, anti-foreigner sentiment that uh, the Chinese have. The uh, original part of the Great Wall by the Xin Dynasty, the Xin Emperor um, was not a good man. Uh, they followed what was called uh, legalism and this uh, process well, kind of uh, was structured on the idea that people are inherently evil and you have to force them to do good. So uh, this means, of course, strict rules, laws, punishment, things like that, and um, uh, also significant expansion and conquest. The Shin Emperor not only imprisoned uh, hundreds of thousands of people but forced over 700,000 people into labor both his own citizens and those that they captured to not only build what were his terracotta warriors which was for the afterlife but also to build the Great Wall of China uh, which then uh, thousands and thousands of people died building because they weren't given enough food water and of course safety regulations wasn't a thing um, so that was that was the the founding of the beginning, the Ming came in and they uh, rebuilt the wall in areas that had, had uh, crumbled and declined and expanded upon uh, the wall as well. They did try initially with the start uh, of the Ming dynasty uh, to help the lower classes, but uh, you had initial problems from the beginning, uh, largely there was what was the civil service, which was the administrators, uh, because of course, um, China is way too large to, to not have administration, um, who uh, controlled most of the military and the resources. 
and consequently they were less interested in uh, projects and policies for the lower classes. So this um, was nominal success. There was a few things that they did throughout the Ming Dynasty, uh, but it, it was not uh, uh, very helpful, we'll say, in the end. Uh, and, and very quickly, right, this initial shift of looking to increase the poor uh, uh, moved uh, the wealth and prosperity that did emerge, uh, ended up really in the palace and the elite uh, and not going to the lower classes as they started. They also um, uh, established early on uh, the secret, po uh, secret police um, and spies to, because there still was a fear of um, conspiracies and those anti-Ming uh, sentiments. Uh, and because of this, this also created some problems with citizens as well. But, uh, you know, that definitely, because of taking over and overthrowing the Mongols, there was uh, a fear of, of um, like I said, conspiracies and, and p potential revolt. But this led to, to torture and uh, prison for uh, lots of people. Um, and... Um, that uh, became uh, problematic as far as, as, as treatment for people, and especially like so the lower classes. Um, were the ones that were largely uh, impacted by this. The uh, capital was uh, moved back to Beijing. And then what you had was the uh, Forbidden City was created, which was, uh, had been uh, the old Mongol imperial compound, and they converted to the, the Forbidden City. And the Forbidden City became um, the, the palace for the king or for the emperor. It was reserved for select people. Like so you, the average citizen could not enter uh, the Forbidden City. Uh, it's an old Mongol palace. Um, and and uh, so, but this this part of it, right, is the the building of the Great Wall, um, the 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 convert uh, converting of the Imperial Palace. You end up with a lot of building projects and exploration early on uh, that is going to end, but at the beginning of the Ming Dynasty, you certainly have a lot of expansion and development that was taking place. They also uh, w took part in uh, uh, repairing the Grand Canal which allowed for uh, merchants and trade and tribute, as well as, so let's see, trade and tribute. You also had uh, early on one of the most uh, massive undertakings, um, which was with uh, uh, Shangha, which uh, was the treasure fleet. Um, they built these huge, what became called treasure ships that were extremely massive uh, and meant for, initially, again, exploration. The main general that was put in in charge of them was uh, uh, Sheng Ha. Um, and he was actually a former court eunuch um, that uh, rose up in position until he became an extremely powerful individual um, to um, control the, um, the main flagship treasure ship and the fleet with him. 
Um, Unix are an interesting thing, um, and and we'll we'll talk in a minute about like how they come to dominate uh, court life in the Ming Dynasty, which is, ends up becoming part of the problem in the process. Uh, within the this um, treasure uh, ship, you had uh, seven main voyages, and a total of seventy ships that were part of of the whole collective and. 30,000 men. These ships were massive. Um, and to give you an idea, oops, I don't mean to click on this. Let's go look at the ship. Here you can see the, uh, uh, the large ship is the treasure uh, ship or the, the fleet. The smaller ship is what the, uh, a, like a caravel and actually a little bit larger, what the Portuguese and um, Spanish were using for their explorations. So this thing was massive. It was essentially like a floating city um, with not only how many people it housed, but um, how many stories it had. Um, you only see on the top, but there were several stories that were uh, below deck. They also grew and had uh, many farms uh, on this, these uh, areas on the ship. Uh, and, and it was, it was massive. These things were, were, again, the best ex description of them were floating cities. Um, and, and to give you an idea of, of, uh, where they traveled here are, are the different voyages that took place. Uh, th this certainly had the capacity to, um, continue further if they had wanted to. Um, they went to the Philippines, Southeast Asia, India, Persia, uh, Arabia, Africa. Um, and with each one, now there was a very specific purpose for this. It was exploration, right? But it wasn't just exploration. It was to, to show the power of the Ming dynasty to other people. And in part, this was because of, of fear and wanting to make sure that other people didn't try to take them over. Some of it was just for pride as well. And then there was, a, an, at the beginning, um, a sense of exploration to see what else was out there, what other options were available with foreign countries, knowledge, things like that. And he was uh, told to um, bring back um, basically lots of things, anything that, that, that could showcase his travels, uh, specifically focusing on animals, uh, knowledge, um, and, and goods that could be useful, right, to China. That was, that was kind of his goal. Um, and he brought back tons of stuff. He brought back a, a giraffe at one point. Like, so, I mean, that's how big these ships were. They could house a giraffe comfortably and still have room for other things. They brought back thousands and thousands of goods, information about other societies. And what ends up getting determined by all of this is that, well, there was some interesting stuff, none of it um, challenged, um, the supremacy of China and it was determined that none of it was stuff that, uh, China did not need the goods, um, that other countries offered, right? There might be some interesting things but that it re-solidified this idea of uh, China as the, um, the supreme leader in technology and culture in their minds. And this does lead to a, a shutting down of um, uh, in a world interaction, right? So this was around the time that we were talking about with Columbus and the Europeans and, and the Ottoman Empire. This wasn't around the time when like people were beginning to explore and expand and increase world trade and China becomes more isolated. Now, not entirely. They don't, they're not ever uh, disconnected completely from the world, 
but this they do pull back into themselves as a sense of that that this the they were had superiority in commerce and technology and ocean travel and that because the others couldn't didn't provide anything that they ultimately needed uh they considered the other cultures inferior um and you uh ended up having a shutdown of the trade and the ships they they just basically decommissioned the chips the chips the ships sorry and, and and that became much more of an isolated structure within that but they did early on like I said have one of the most impressive uh naval exploration uh ships and structure out there um before any of the other uh, groups and Europeans around the world, um, as they said, exploring a world and discovering new areas, China chose not to get involved in that structure. I think we're on C here. Um, so this this uh, uh, aspect, they still continue to do trade, right? They just focus more on overland trade and and a more local trade um, because so you just didn't have that need for longer exploration and structure that the treasure ships could have provided um, and while it did allow for some commerce and trade that's this is what they continued right we'll put that here it did continue commerce and trade um, it's certainly how their wealth significantly increased. And then what they made people do is they had to pay a tax or tribute for outsiders to trade. So again, they didn't shut themselves off completely, but they stopped initiating any of that exploration and instead let people come to them for trading seeing as they needed stuff and then they could make wealth and money off of it, but they weren't going to go out because there was not a need for it. There wasn't something that it provided. Um, as uh, uh, the Ming Dynasty became extremely wealthy and centralized bureaucratic system, uh, they did end up having uh, a lot of, of stability issues within the uh, empire. Apologize if you can hear my dog whining. She apparently can't uh, sit there at, without me paying her attention. So the Ming stability issues. One of the things that, that uh, took place with this is that uh, the whole system created a significant drain on the economy. As much as they were making wealth and structure from uh, trade and commerce, um, you did have several things that were a factor on, on draining the economy. One was that there was a, a continued Mongol threat. And so this led to, as we already talked about with the Great Wall of China, significant military and building uh, projects and structures, which... Um, are expensive. It's expensive to maintain a large military. It's expensive to build and continue to expand the Great Wall of China. Anytime, like I said, that you have uh, to maintain a large military and uh, are, are constantly building, you're exhausting resources uh, through taxes, through labor, um, and, and that becomes can become problematic. One of the other areas that it became a huge drain and became problematic was uh, with the eunuchs um, that uh, ended up uh, becoming, in some aspects, uh, de facto rulers. So eunuchs were, um, originally, eunuchs were um, made to guard um, the harems of kings. Usually um, it would be slaves. It could be captured soldiers sometimes, um, but they definitely did prefer uh, slaves. So, uh, unfortunate, uh, usually, sometimes it was with young boys, it, it, the age varied, it depended on the time period and, and culture and location, but what would happen is that you would uh, have a slave 
that um, one, you decided that they were going to be eunuch instead of some other type of slave. There were a couple of different things they did. Uh, one um, method was to crush the testicles um, with, so that uh, one, the, the purpose was that they were supposed to be guarding the harems, which was the harems were uh, a group of concubines and the concubines were reserved only for the king. They didn't want regular soldiers or men guarding the concubines because, of course, there was always a fear that they would end up having sex with them or fall in love and run away with them. So if you created eunuchs who didn't have proper function and use of, of their private parts, then ultimately they wouldn't be able to have sex with the uh, concubines. So they either crush the testicles and or uh, the penis itself or they cut it off. Um, and then this was Dane, both, both methods were painful and dangerous because they certainly weren't giving them pain medicine before they did this. Um, and, and then of course, besides the pain of the initial process, then there was a chance that you died, um, because of the trauma. Um, and there was, there was a waiting period of, of once as you started to heal from it, uh, were you able to pee properly, which was a huge deal because it could damage the ability to pee. Uh, and, and pee clear rather than pee in blood. Uh, if with healing you were able to do this, then you were in the clear and you survived. Um, and so th that is how Unix was started, was for the harems and the kings. What happened with China is that um, the, the uh, emperor began to um, prefer Unix uh, to be advisors and later administrators, part of the administration. So they uh, moved beyond their initial purpose of why eunuchs were around, which was to guard the harems. Um, and the reason for this is that you had um, kings and emperors who felt that um, because they didn't have um, have family and could not have children for heirs, right? Um, and which w the the fear being that for nobility, right, their focus and goal was for uh, enriching themselves and their uh, family, specifically, of course, with the idea that their children, delay there, um, you know, that in, would inherit their title and their name and their wealth, that, that this was going to be their goal. But, right, because Unix did not have that, um, then there was a connection to this that they were more loyal and, um, and not uh, self what interested invested um, for in, in in decisions right that they would make the decisions that were best for the king rather than themselves now this is not entirely true uh, and that's not what happened but that was the belief, right, is that they, they lacked the motivation and desire uh, and greed that the noble class had. Um, and so they ended up becoming extremely close um, to the, the emperor. Um, and and it, they ran, be, they, they started off first as advisors. And then as, and then as emperors continued, you had emperors that just left the entire running of king, the kingdom uh, to the eunuchs, to a group of eunuchs that he had put in charge. And so, of course, this did create uh, um, people who used this position uh, to create their own power and wealth. Uh, and they definitely had ambition. Um, I mean, that was the, the argument and, well, not even the argument, but, um, the belief is that they would lack ambition because they didn't have family and, and that's not, uh, the case. Uh, and this eventually did lead to not only, um, the, 
group of eunuchs running the government and controlling it, they did end up making uh, many bad decisions for the empire itself, in part because of uh, lack of knowledge, and then others because of greed and self-interest. And, and the power, because they were given almost unlimited power by um, several of the emperors. This also led to people choosing to be eunuchs. Those that, right, something that had not really happened before. Um, those that um, were, you know, lower class and that were never going to have an opportunity uh, to become wealthier and expand. Uh, the becoming a eunuch was a way to be able to get in to be in a close advisor potentially to the emperor. Uh, and so you actually had a tradition and practice of making, uh, of, of becoming a eunuch uh, by choice versus just those headed who in the past had been kidnapped and forced into that position. Um, it was a, a very intricate process and, and a lot of, of uh, deception. But this is also where, of course, filial piety comes in and becomes problematic because um, other advisors and administrators came up against the idea of, not, you know, you, you're not supposed to tell off the king. You're not supposed to tell off the emperor because he's the highest in all of the filial piety. You do what he says. And even if you see that, that the eunuchs don't know what they're doing, if the emperor is saying that this is what he wants and this is who he trusts, it's really hard to go against that within Chinese society, specifically with filial piety. Um, then you also ended up having, which kind of continued with this process, um, was the um, erratic behavior of Ming emperors that just continued to um, grow uh, over time with, with a variety of emperors near, especially um, during the declining period of the Ming dynasty. Um, and, and it varied, right? There wasn't one uh, size fits all. Some were uh, capricious and cruel. And uh, that was going back to like the torture and punishment of, of people that they enjoyed inflicting that. Um, there were others that uh, limited, um, uh, again, the access uh, and function of the government in favor of um, the eunuchs. And the problem with this um, is that China, again, is massive. And the administration is massive. You, you can't effectively run the system with, uh, you know, 20, 30 eunuchs. It's not enough. The civil service... Um, and this, this goes to uh, this function that they had set up long ago in past uh, uh, Chinese dynasties. The Civil Service Administration was the uh, mass bureaucratic system that functioned to control different regions and areas, collect taxes, uh, make sure things ran, uh, and that took thousands and thousands of people. And this then became uh, uh, the, an entire bureaucratic system controlled by a very small group of people that often were, like I said, looking out for their own uh, interests and stuff. Then you also had other Ming emperors that spent all their time uh, in uh, what, court pleasures, if you will, uh, focused on women, drinking, dancing, uh, and didn't care about the actual politics at all. Um, there was one emperor that didn't know how to write at all, and his entire reign was just focused on hobbies that he did, and he left everyone else to run the the empire. Um, which, but it shows you the problem um, of not only the education and preparation, but as you continue to have more and more eccentric emperors, their children become more eccentric as well. Um, because right. If you, if, if you have one that spent all their time on court pleasures 
um, and, uh, and hobbies, how well educated, right, are his children going to be, um, and prepared, uh, for running a government, uh, it just, you know, it's just a domino, uh, effect. They were also, several of the emperors were extremely extravagant and lavish in spending. And this, uh, did end up putting a dent and caused significant problems with the finances, uh, and, and ability to function as a government. And it's going to weaken them, uh, which is going to allow them to be taken over. The other issue did have to do with the civil service administration. Now, it, while the eunuchs were often in charge, um, and running things in the later period, they, they still had a civil service administration. And part of the problem that emerged from this is that it was mostly nobility um, that ran it. Now, the civil service administration was actually something that was set up in the Han dynasty, so several dynasties before, and it was not meant just for nobility. It was something that was supposed to be for anyone that showed merit and knowledge and understanding um, and it was meant to be taken seriously and all, and, and, um, that wasn't really present in the later Ming dynasty at all. Instead, it was not only largely made up of nobility, but because they often didn't have specific duties that they were supposed to do because it was left to the eunuchs, uh, or emperors who didn't care, which was another huge part of it, right? If you have a, a leader who doesn't care what you do, um, it, it allowed for corruption, and you did, you had quite a bit of corruption that took place specifically, of course, looking to make money for themselves. Um, and, and then you also did have to have some pushback against uh, a lot of what the, the civil service administration structure was, which was, uh, connected to Confucianism and Confucius policy and, and, well, and philosophy, um, uh, resisted, innovation, um, and, and commerce, uh, merchants were seen as the low, low, lowest, lowly list, <laughs> the lowest, um, group. And yet trade was one of their biggest ways of making a significant amount of money. Um, change also was, was, um, not something that was, uh, they were big on. And so, which is the whole innovation component of it in that process. This all led to a weakened system and state, um, that became, uh, dangerous and ultimately led to their downfall. Uh, you also had a problem with, uh, foreign intruders. Right. And, and this is specifically because of trade. Um, one of those of course was what had kickstarted off a, a while back with European exploration and looking, uh, for trade. And what happens with this is that, uh, a lot of the rules that they set up be, and, and this did, it was impacted by the fact, um, that, uh, they, China had, you know, at the beginning of the Ming dynasty, essentially, essentially stepped back from that process and didn't partake in it in an active way, instead trying to just regulate through taxes and tribute, uh, access to them. And so you had more, uh, forward and, uh, you could argue ambitious, but also disrespectful groups such as European explorers that, uh, and, and the Portugal, uh, the Portuguese were one of the biggest uh, or the earliest to do this and others are going to join in is that they completely, uh, disregarded, uh, Chinese law. Uh, they, they just, uh, decided to ignore it and not follow it. Um, and, um, this, uh, created problems. The other thing that happened, of course, was views of this. The Chinese saw them as unclean, and so many did not want to deal with them. And uh, this led to them being able to take advantage of certain laws. 
then the Portuguese themselves often purchased um, Chinese children for slaves the lo of lower classes. And not always by, uh, you know, parents or others. It was sometimes, but also then it started a whole uh, slave network of children being kidnapped. Um, and, and then you have both sides uh, looking at each other and seeing each other as uncivilized. And so there was a lack of communication. The Portuguese ultimately, uh, 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 f tried to, um, force their way in further. They did eventually get pushed, uh, to a specific trading post. So, uh, finally created a specific trading post. For them, which uh, is what they what they wanted, right? In return, um, but had to pay tribute. Uh, but the this the originally the Chinese did not want to create a trading post. You were supposed to come in, pay the tribute, get to trade and leave, not create. Right? This creates a permanent location for foreigners. And it also reinforces the whole disregarding Chinese law kind of thing is that they got benefit from that. Later, you have um, the Dutch and English come in and insist on their own trading ports as well. Um, and so it created a whole trading market with Chinese goods, um, which, uh, you know, what went around the world and traded around the world. But it, it also uh, created problems and weakened uh, the Ming Dynasty. You also had uh, the Japanese that were looking to uh, invest in the Chinese wealth and market. Because again, the Ming Dynasty, even with all these problems, was for quite a long period in time extremely wealthy. And so you had two groups, sailors and soldiers, that were eager to get part uh, to take part and become involved in the market and the Chinese wealth. They also, no one I'm sure wanted to um, pay tribute. <laughs> uh, and they saw uh, the Europeans that were pushing back against Chinese laws and structure and felt that, that they didn't need to as well. They were more direct with plunder and uh, theft um, than the Europeans, although they, they stole as well. But you had a huge problem with pirates attacking uh, Chinese market uh, vessels um, that were, you know, not doing long distance trade, uh, but, but going around, um, so market merchant vessels. Um, and, and stealing their goods. You also had ships full of samurai warriors um, that specifically sailed and landed in China to um, pillage and then quickly leave. Right, so there was that kind of hit and run of, of, of go in, uh, do a blitz attack, uh, uh, kill people, steal what you want, and then get back on the ship and take off. Um, there were some organized a attacks as well. Um, the, the, I mean, the, the pillaged ones were individual groups, but you had larger organized atta uh, attacks. They also hired Chinese pirates to help them out. Uh, all of this created economic instability. Um, they, they, China eventually banned trade with Japan. Um, because of the plundering and uh, pillaging and attacks and of course just complete dis, uh, destabilization uh, that took place with what they were doing. And, and this led to conflict and uh, war with Japan, which of course uh, is going to create more instability, more economic uh, push on having reserves for the military. Uh, and it led many to start questioning um, if the Ming dynasty had the mandate from heaven, uh, and allowed for, um, uh, the, uh, the Xing dynasty to emerge. 
so all of this uh, instability and which you have from from uh, raiders, from people taking advantage of the market, from the instability of the emperors, from expenses and cost, eventually destabilized the Ming Dynasty enough to allow it to collapse. Uh, uh, from that, um, you have uh, the Ming Dynasty that is going to emerge and take over. Uh, the group that uh, uh, made up the uh, uh, Xing Dynasty were the Manchus. They initially were uh, pastoral uh, nomads. Um, and uh, went back when they started, but eventually while they had um, uh, uh, turned uh, to agriculture and settled lands in, in southern Manchuria, they also had been trading with China ever since the Xin Dynasty, um, as well as Clash. So uh, from this, they did shift to agriculture and settle, but you have a connection to China all the way back to, like I said, as the, the Xin Dynasty where you had both, uh, of, and continuously, it wasn't just with the Shin Dynasty, but back to the Shin Dynasty with both trade and conflict. So there was something that um, uh, they looked over for land and resources, of course, a, a Chinese border, um, and, and all of that. Uh, part of the reason that they were successful uh, had to do with um, well, two things, reasons for their success. Um, one, of course, was their military, which uh, was uh, strong, and uh, they used uh, newer tactics that were quite successful. The other is that you actually had uh, Chinese support for the Manchus. Not obviously everyone. Um, but that there was significant Chinese support um, uh, near at the end of the Ming Dynasty for the Manchus coming in and taking over. Now, this didn't mean uh, altogether because there, they did have to fight back uh, pockets of resistance and there were groups that formed to try to overthrow the Manchus and regain control. But you also had another group of the population that did that supported them. Um, you had uh, between 1630 and 1640, you had uh, Chinese um, generals that deserted the Ming Dynasty because of corruption, and um, they went to. Um, the uh, the Manchus and offered their support and, and actively worked uh, against them and the corruption it was so one was corruption the ineffective uh, emperors um, you also had a, an extreme dislike by a large part of the portion of the population of the eunuchs and the control they had so you, you had this um, one, the dislike of the corruption and the lack of leadership by the emperor, but then um, that, that was a, a smaller percentage of the population than the numbers that, that actually disliked what the eunuchs were doing. And there were plenty that didn't end up revolting or, or fighting against the Ming Dynasty because of the eunuchs, but it, it was a significant portion of the population that while they wouldn't say anything when the Ming Emperor was in charge, definitely did not uh, like that structure and wanted it gone. The other thing that uh, had influence uh, was with um, Confucian scholars. And Confucius uh, philosophy um, was the um, main uh, structure both within the civil service administration along within just beliefs and that that had been established all the way back in the warring states period so many many dynasties and, and periods ago and it had been something that had been a consistent thing thread through uh, Chinese history and dynasties and um, Confucius scholars and bureaucrats um, worked against 
the Ming Dynasty as well. And again, for similar reasons, uh, as far as uh, not liking the corruption, although several in the service, civil services we saw were corrupt themselves, not liking the eunuchs control, um, but but it had the civil service administration really had become this weakened system that didn't have a lot of authority or control anymore, and so there were many who uh, uh, wanted the original intent of the civil service to come back following closely Confucius policy and they believed that um, the uh, they would get um, more respect they would get more authority they would get a more serious and focused structure within the civil service with Manchu ruling elite because the Manchu ruling elite uh, were trained um, in Confucius um, uh, uh, policy and thought uh, as well as uh, Chinese language. And so this, of course, uh, ingratiated them and made them seem less as outsiders um, than uh, they would have been otherwise. One of the other things that they did is that they uh, put a huge focus on the mandate of heaven. Now the mandate of heaven was, uh, it was a document. It was something that actually was created uh, a long time ago with the, early, uh, the establishment of the Zhou dynasty. Um, and it was meant to establish uh, essentially what a good king was. Um, and what a bad king was. And, and uh, within the document, it says basically that the mandate of heaven is given to a good king um, by uh, the general heaven god kind of thing. It was not specific with... Uh, the belief system other than that, that the mandate of heaven was was given by a deity or or the holy kind of of, of belief system of, of God in this kind of general sense right to a good king as long as he was following um, those the rules as a good king then he would be secure in his rule a bad king would lose the mandate of heaven And that would show justification to, because one of the problems of overthrowing a king, right, is the challenge to filial piety. So this is how they got around the whole filial piety component. If you overthrew a king or took over a different dynasty, is you just say, well, that king lost the mandate of heaven, so I didn't have to follow filial piety anymore because that was revoked from him. And so he didn't have that authority and right in filial piety. Because uh, otherwise you do come across that problem where it is a very significant roadblock uh, with the belief system of filial piety. Um, and so, and this document listed, like it, it listed, here's, here's what makes a good king. People who are wise, people who listen to um, those below them, people who treat people well, that are loyal, um, that um, are educated. And then it lists uh, these, these rules for what makes a bad king, which are those who do, have excessive drinking, um, that all they do is fun, spend their time chasing women and, and pleasures, who, who don't listen to wise men and only uh, listen to those of the youth. Essentially, all that the Ming emperors, the successive group of Ming emperors had been doing, what they'd been doing, uh, uh, fit exactly into that list in, in this document of what a bad king was. So it was not a stretch. It was not hard uh, for not only the people to probably think that they were failing, but for the, 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 the Manchus to come in and create the Xing dynasty and say the Ming emperors lost the mandate of heaven. And so they, they used it as propaganda right, to, to uh, establish control as well as, as gain support, right? It gave them a justification. It gave them a justification and it gave the, the Chinese people a, a reason to support the Xin Dynasty 
uh, not the Shin, sorry, the, the Xing Dynasty over the Ming Dynasty. Um, and they definitely used it very well as propaganda. The other thing that was connected to this um, had to do with using the Mandate of Heaven, but also others, was uh, what you could argue um, uh, reestablishing, um, not, it was already there, uh, but putting an emphasis on cert specific aspects of Chinese culture and making clear that these things were going to be important. So one was what we just talked about with the mandate of heaven. They uh, most certainly then also reinforced filial piety. Now that hadn't gone away at all, um, but it, it doesn't hurt to reinforce it because it makes it harder again to revolt against them once they've established that they have the mandate of heaven. Um, and, and then they also uh, re-focused uh, on creating and um, putting in the civil service administration um, the way that the Confucius scholars wanted it. And then, uh, as mentioned, incorporating uh, Confucianism into the government uh, and the civil service administration. And, and by doing this, uh, you make sure that you have um, significant uh, support um, for, uh, by the population, right? Um, and this, this propaganda um, uh, kind of uh, structured all aspects of, of what they did. So one of the things that, that happened with the, the, was the propaganda and the mandate of heaven um, was to um, create a kind of um, choreographed performance uh, to reinforce the, the king's authority. Um, and it, it goes into all of, all of these areas. Um, we'll put that with... We could go with well, we could go with propaganda here with this, but it, it, it fit into the mandate of heaven, filial piety, and emphasis on these these aspects. Um, so we'll but we'll we'll throw it into propaganda too because it is important. So what you had is that you you they use the forbidden city to reinforce um, the king's the emperor's control as well as showcase off again, Chinese culture, the fact that they were in charge and all of that. So you had uh, a series of, uh, besides this pageantry behind it, daily uh, inspections that uh, uh, the king took part in. Um, you had audiences, public audiences, where people could see that he was listening to, like, people go petition the emperor, or, or you would have um, uh, any type of, like, if there was a conflict, they could go, and then it would be seen that he was listening to the people. They had uh, banquets uh, to appease uh, not only the civil servant administrations, but the wealthy and the nobility, and other official duties. Uh, all of these things were, were very public, even though the Forbidden City certainly could be something that you, um, and in the past they had kind of uh, walled off and not made accessible. They made it more accessible to the people. They made it very public um, and, and, and made a sense of power. One of the other things that they did in terms of propaganda was to, again, reinforce filial piety, but the power of the emperor. So they took the concept of the forbidden city and, and things that had been forbidden and made the imperial wardrobe, uh, the clothes that um, the uh, emperor wore and, per and certain personal effects uh, and items um, be, uh, forbidden to all others, right? Only the king had the authority 
uh, in, in all of, of China to be able to wear these type of clothes or have these specific items. It was reserved for the emperor himself. Um, and the written characters of the emperor's name were also um, taboo and forbidden for, for other people to write. Um, uh, and, and that way, right, it, it, it gives, all of this gives a sense of power and authority, mystery, which then, uh, a rein, is reinforced by filial piety. And so, because the whole point is, right, they, they, they don't, don't, uh, challenge the emperor. Right, he's going to be set up as so far above and ahead of everyone else that it makes it extremely difficult to challenge his authority. Uh, they they didn't allow so you, the, while there were personal audiences um, or public displays of pageantries and, and banquets and and um, different edicts and inspections, a personal audience was uh, very difficult to get to. You had uh, multiple steps and stages and people that you had to go through in order to get to the king or to the emperor, right? And then you had to uh, perform uh, a, a kowtow which uh, if you did get to see the emperor, which was uh, uh, kneeling, uh, you, th you kneeled three times and what were called nine head knockings. And it was meant to reinforce that you were lower physically than the king uh, or the emperor, um, and, and those who failed this in even the most minor way could face serious punishment. Even the highest officials could be flogged with a bamboo canes, um, and which sometimes caused death. Um, so it, it was meant to showcase the power. It was definitely propaganda, um, um to reinforce their control. Uh, and all of this was incredibly, successful and allowed them to gain a foothold and control that then wasn't uh, challenged. And by reintroducing um, traditional Chinese uh, values uh, and, and changing up and what would be called like a re um, hauling the civil service administration kind of to what the Han dynasty had done, it gave them the power and authority to, to, not be challenged in the long run. So the civil service administration um, wasn't new. It was something that was connected to the Han Dynasty and, and even the Ming Dynasty was using it. The, the thing was that the Ming Dynasty wasn't using it the way the Han Dynasty had. As we talked about, it was corrupt. The nobility were largely in charge but not doing much outside of for their own personal gain. Um, and so they rehauled the civil service administration because the reality is if you want effective um, uh, running of the government, you need, um, in China with how large it is, you need a good administration, right? The bureaucrats are the ones that are doing the day-to-day -day work to make a government successful. Now, they already had on their side uh, the benefit that you had many Confucius scholars and some civil servants, but especially the scholars supporting them in this. Um, and so this, they, they reinstituted uh, this a very rigorous testing system and process uh, to be selected. And, and the goal, which is what the Han Dynasty had done, is that you make this uh, something that is a desire uh, that, that people want to do. In fact, that people will compete for. 
and and that that's ultimately what they're going to do with this situation of how they set it up um so uh in order if you wanted to be a bureaucrat essentially you had to start training as soon as uh traditional schooling began right so this was something that you studied for years most of your life Now, this did favor the wealthy, but they did, uh, unlike with the Ming Dynasty, um, uh, ambition and uh, merit uh, did play a role, right? Because ultimately it's gonna be based on the test, the final test. And it doesn't matter if you're nobility, it doesn't matter if you're wealthy, if you can't, if you don't do really, really well in this final test, you're not going to be part of the civil service. You know, where, where, where it favors the wealthy is, of course, that in education and training, they're going to have more resources. And so they're going to have an advantage for the test. But they, there was not any more of the, the nobility were not passing it down to their children without at least, they had to pass the test, they had to go through this process. Um, and so this, this uh, did require and create some, kind, some aspects of merit. If you had um, poor uh, villages, if you had someone that showed promise, um, they would pool their resources and uh, send uh, um, uh, what, uh, the individual to schooling. Because the idea was, is that one, well, one, what they, what they did also with the civil service is that it, it paid well and they restored the idea of, uh, prestige and value in the position and so if you were from a smaller poorer village if you ended up getting the position you you would you were not allowed to govern your territory that you grew up in but what it meant is that you got paid enough that you could give back some of your income to the village uh, and it did usually raise a poor village status um, and so there were villages, like I said, that, that were sent individuals. By the time students were 11 or 12, they had often memorized uh, massive uh, parts of the Confucius curriculum. Uh, you had to know the entirety of works. It was based on uh, Confucianist thought. And that was, again, something that had started with the Han Dynasty, but it had gone away in some aspects of it. But you also, so you had, you had to know the analytics, you had to know any type of philosophy with that. Um, that also had uh, calligraphy, which was, uh, I mean, an art in itself that, that people trained uh, for years in so this wasn't just like handwriting this was something that um, was uh, its own mastery and skill uh, in of itself and so not only do you have to have memorized by you know what would be middle school today uh, a whole entire works of philosophy word for word you had to also then uh, a, a train in calligraphy which uh, was again a, a job that took years to master. Uh, Chinese calligraphy was um, uh, a serious thing. So you had um, the earlier characters which were like uh, pictographs and in, in in, in early type of writing development, right? It's pictures. So the early characters looked more like the picture of what they represented and then you had um, the uh, a more formal form of it and, and then you had a more artistic 
form. Uh, and 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 this, like I said, the, at each stroke, the way the way that you put each stroke on the character mattered. It was very complex. Uh, poetry, uh, essay composition, these were all things. Government policy, which uh, was rooted in Confucius thought. You had to learn um, all, all of these uh, different things. Histories. The history of China, literary works uh, besides Confucianism. It was a very robust and round training um, for the civil service exam. You took several exams um, in, in your life and uh, you had to pass those right, to keep moving on. So, right, that makeup was smaller exams through the years. And then you had one large final exam. This exam was uh, crazy <laughs> as far as what you had to do. Uh, it was a variety of tests. Um, and you had one, you were competing against, uh, there were, there were more, um, people taking the test, uh, than there were spots and they wanted it this way. Um, because what you created was a demand, uh, than government spots. You created a demand, a desire, right? This, this creates a desire for the job. People want to serve, right? the government. And if people are wanting uh, to serve the government, then they are not revolting. Um, and so, so you often had, let's say, it was, it was like a 50% uh, in that you might have 2,000 spots, uh, I mean 1,000 spots, but 2,000 students showing up uh, to take the exam. So even if you passed the exam, so even if you passed the final exam, it didn't guarantee you uh, a spot in the government. Uh, no guarantee of position. If, if you passed, but you were not the highest in the, you know, they, they basically, they took the highest scores and the highest scores got the, up until the positions were filled. Let's say you passed, but your score was not high enough to get one of the positions. Uh, then you could become a tutor and that wasn't a horrible job, but it, you, it was your life's, this was your life's work. Um, and that even the fact that you could, you could pass and not get a position was somewhat devastating in that process. Um, and, uh, they, you had, like I said, throughout it, you, you often had, um, to take, uh, uh, several exams, uh, and multiple times just to get the degree in order to get the, the, the final, uh, exam itself. Um, and the, the exam itself was extremely, uh, long and, and difficult. You, uh, showed up at the, the time of the exam and, uh, once it started, you could not leave. And it was not just a one uh, day thing. This was a, a multi-day test, right? And so you had, you had to stay in your little cubicle space that they gave you for testing until you were done. So you showed up at the examination compound and each candidate brought um, with them a series of things to ideally be prepared with that, uh, a, a water pitcher, um, so that you didn't go thirsty and you could also clean stuff. You had to have a chamber pot because, uh, right, that's to go to the bathroom in. You weren't allowed to leave. If you left your little cubicle that they gave you, I mean, it was, a, it was like a little, little tiny room, a square room with a mat and then, and then nothing in it. You had to bring all the supplies. If you left that, your exam was done. So, and because it was a multi-day thing, you didn't leave that area. You had to have your own chamber pot, your own bedding for, for taking naps, your own food so you didn't go hungry, uh, an inkstone, of course, 
uh, um, and then ink and brushes for writing, right? The, you brought all this stuff. Then you proceeded, they, 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 the guards checked your identity. They searched you for hidden and printed materials. Um, and it was just enough. Your little, uh, room was just enough to accommodate you and your possessions. Um, and they had a, they did have a desk there for you to write on. And then you spent three days and two nights in the room, uh, writing, all of these essays on questions that the examiners created. There, you like I said, there weren't interruptions, there weren't communication between the uh, candidates. They actually had people who died during these things, um, and uh, it was extremely stressful and and crazy. Those who, again, and then if you passed, you hope that you passed with enough high enough score so that you actually got a position. But if you were successful. This opened the door to uh, um, a better future for some, others for uh, buying into the propaganda of, of what it provided, uh, which was this idea of serving um, a, a bureaucratic system, a government with the emperor that was strong, uh, and also reinforced, again, back to this idea of Confucius ideals that... Um, this the civil servants the ideals that the civil servants um were important they were needed and the the, the Xing dynasty did a good job at this part of it they were um the ones that would be protecting their um their area right of where they were responsible for and and looking after the people and it created this sense of of something uh you know greater than themselves in that sense um and by focusing on this uh, uh it made sure that people uh, competed to serve the government right created a competition to work for the emperor and all of this, uh, but it was needed, right? That, that is, it is needed. It was key. It, it, it create this, all of this created a stability and security for the Xing dynasty. All right, I want to look at one other thing within this, um, which is uh, women and um, some of the continuing role in view of women, as well as um, uh, changes uh, to some opportunities for women in the process. Um, let's see, we were on four, oh, five, maybe. That's okay. We'll go with five. Uh, so women. Now, the role of women in China um, was um, consistent through a lot of it. You do have um, an increase in uh, women's roles, especially wealthy families in part because there was an increase in education and that ended up applying to women and, and that was uh, because of a focus of uh, a literacy culture within China. Um, and women were able to participate in this with um, writing and poetry in fact, you had some women who uh, were or publishers that were able to publish. Now, it wasn't uh, uh, the, the majority, but it, it, it was allowed. Um, and uh, this allowed for um, uh, state-sponsored schools 
who are women to participate in. The thing with um, this, so that this gave them some, right, the ability to earn some money did give them some freedom and agency. The other thing that uh, does that is filial piety, right? And we, we saw that with um, the stories that mothers have authority and power above their children. Grandmothers have authority and power above, uh, you know, those below them. And so filial piety does, in a sense, give women certain power and authority. It's still under certain conditions, and women are still always underneath men in authority. But men, they're, so their husbands, their fathers, uh, older men, their sons, uh, and, and, and boys and younger men, they're not. Um, and so that, that's where you get that agency and freedom above that. And because the Xing Dynasty reinforced filial piety, it, it reinforced uh, uh, women having some of that control and agency. However, on the other side of that, you still have um, not only laws, but cultural practices um, that reinforced uh, women as uh, property with one of the readings, the idea of, of not only arranged marriages, but also arranged marriages for money. Um, uh, for women were often, they didn't have very little choice in who they married. They were, their, mar their marriages were arranged and, and, you know, could be used uh, in order to, to get money or certain goods for the marriage. Uh, and in the one case, uh, the father not only uh, arranging a marriage, but then uh, a, a second marriage in order to uh, uh, get goods out of out of the process. Uh, now that it was that was frowned upon to be used in that way, but it didn't mean it didn't happen. Um, you also had foot binding, foot binding, which emerged um, prior to the Xing Dynasty, but continued through it. Um, and this was a process um, where, uh, well, one, it was connected to uh, the belief that uh, small feet were beautiful and specifically meant uh, it was for the wealthy and, and it reinforced that wealth and status. So lower class women did not usually have their foot bound because it had extreme limitations. Um, uh, the idea was, of course, and part of the connection to the beauty was the fact of the limitation, right? It, it created extreme limitations. It was done um, uh, on infants. It's, well, it started with infants and then continued on. And they would, uh, right when the infants uh, were, when you're little, your, your bones are a little bit more malleable. So they'd wrap the feet, um, curving the, the toes uh, underneath and up to the heel. Uh, and this led to, you, you had uh, your bones uh, breaking of bones and resetting and forming until it shrunk the foot. Of course, the problem with this, besides the pain uh, that it created throughout early life, is that it was painful to walk on, even, you know, years later. But the purpose of this, right, then was the idea that uh, it showed wealth because wealthy women uh, did not need to work and uh, could stay, you know, in the domestic sphere, inside the house. Um, and, and, and so this, this was seen as extremely feminine. 
right and that and the beauty part of it but definitely because of this idea um, right so the fact that it, you, you weren't gonna you couldn't walk very far um, women had to be uh, carried around in, in um, carriages or the the hand carts where they had servants or slaves that uh, carried the poles and they were in the little tent and, and carried around that way because you could not walk very far with it it was it was not comfortable it was painful um, and it was a painful process all the way through um, and so the you had this process that was at its height during this period um, which of course was definitely the opposite of that you also have general cultural practices and beliefs uh, on the role of uh, on the role of women there is uh, a, a source Van Zao lessons for women she wrote it now so here again shows this contradictory nature she was very extremely well educated And she also actually, uh, she was a librarian. She was, she was a, a historian. Her father was a, a royal historian. And uh, she, she took over that role in part. And, and she does uh, promote uh, education for women. as well as um, a loving relationship between husband and wife. And, and so, so in this sense, right, uh, and, and also she said, you know, said that uh, women, specifically wives, right, uh, should not be beat. Should not be physically abused. So all of this, right, she did promote. At the same time, the language and descriptors that are used in her writing um, reinforce women as inferior. So let's look at um, that. Here is, this is from uh, Ben Zhao's Lessons for Women, right? Just at the very beginning here, you have, um, right, I, the unworthy writer, am unsophisticated, unenlightened, and by nature unintelligent. Um, and, and, and then she says that, you know, uh, I, I constantly feared, I feared constantly that I might disgrace my parents, um, and being careless and by nature stupid, you know, listen to all those descriptions and stuff like that. So she, this is her introduction for why she's writing this. She's like, I realized I didn't, uh, uh, teach my daughters correctly and so now I'm writing this uh, you know with hope for my daughters and on also for, in general for people to understand um, so at the same time she's advocating for women to be educated at the same time she's advocating for a loving relationship between husband and wife and um, to to not be physically abused she's also using descriptors and the re and this this wasn't abnormal to make sure that she could get those points across across she had to use the language and descriptors of women that was acceptable within society and it was this um, and then you have a list and description of customs for when a girl is born the there's three customs the first is to place the baby below the bed the second to give her a pot shard with which to play, and then the third to announce her birth to the ancestors. Now, the the the, the third one it was normal for boys and girls, but the first two are, are significant to look at. The you lay the baby below the bed plainly indicated that she is lowly and weak, uh, and it should be her it should regard it as her primary duty to humble herself before others. You give her the pot shards with which to play, and duly signify that she should practice labor and consider it her primary duty to be industrious, right? That's the domestic 
the idea of giving pottery pieces um, and and uh, that idea of, of domestic in the kitchen, the idea of working within the house, and then that lowly and humble and stuff. So she's even described this is the traditional kitchen. Uh, traditions of what we do when a girl is born Um, and then it says these three ancient customs epitomize a woman's ordinary way of life she should modestly yield to others let her respect others let her put others first herself last if she do something good let her not mention it Um, and if she does something bad let her not deny it let a ret- woman retire late to bed, but rise early to duties, right? So you're supposed to be the first to rise, the last to go to sleep. You're supposed to serve everyone else and not think about yourself, um, right? Her character is in order to serve her husband. Let her live in purity and quietness of spirit. You observe these three things, then you have a good reputation, right? And then she does talk about with husband and wife, the idea of, of um, having a positive relationship and then you have womanly qualifications a woman ought to have four qualifications womanly virtue womanly words womanly bearing womanly works and then she lists these right so one here to guard carefully her chastity to control circumspectly her behavior and every motion to exhibit modesty and to model each act on the best uses this is womanly virtue um, womanly words, to choose her words with care, to avoid vulgar language, to expre- speak at appropriate times, and not to weary others with much conversation. So basically, you know, don't, don't speak uh, much. Um, and, and this one is, is modesty. And then uh, for womanly bearing, to wash and scrub filth away, to keep clothes and ornaments fresh and clean, to wash the head and bathe, Um, right? This is just being clean, both in the home and self. And then lastly, womanly work, with wholehearted devotion to sew and weave, to love not to gossip and silly laughter, Uh, serving guests, so it, it's serving others and domestic, right? So the idea is, and, and the point with this is just the, that um, it, you had this dichotomy between filial piety and, and some changes in society that allowed for women's education, for involvement in, in uh, um, writing publications, for, for being able to earn some wages. And at the same time, you had foot binding and this culture and characterization of women as uh, below, not only below men, but, but to serve others, to, to not question, to, to be the one that is, does everything and all the hard labor that can, with arranged marriages, uh, be bought and sold in some ways. Um, and have very little say uh, over their life. Um, and, and that uh, is something that continued to be an issue for China. Um, and you could argue even to this day there's issues with, when you look at the China's uh, one-child law that, that it has no, is no longer in effect, but that, that men, boys, were valued highly over girls, and so girls were either aborted or given up or, or, or uh, killed sometimes uh, in order to not have a girl because a girl was seen as so much more worse than the, the, the need to have a boy because boys were put so far above because of culture and practices. So this has a long lasting impact. It isn't something that just took place. Obviously foot binding eventually ended because of, of um, uh, outcry and condemnation from the world uh, earlier than, than other policies and belief. But the, the, the views and expectation of women to be quiet, to be meek, to be submissive, those are still there and practice in many ways. Um, and, and so that, uh, played a significant role in, for women's lives within, um, the, the Ming and Qing dynasty, but also in later China as well.